Yeah. Okay, so it's recording now. Ah. Oh. Put it here. Yeah. Okay. Well, good, good evening, everybody. I'm sorry for the delay. We had a bit of Zoom trouble, but we're now just sticking with an audio recording on my telephone, so yeah. much simpler. Well, it's an immense pleasure and honour to welcome David Bentley Hart to Cambridge. Like almost no other living theologian, David enjoys a reputation as a great man of English letters, with a global reputation not just for theology, but also for philosophy, contemporary cultural debate, literary and aesthetic commentary and creative writing. It is very difficult to exaggerate concerning David and even his own exaggerations concerning himself turn out to the dismay of his various foes who all do him proud to be understatements. Who can match the range of his linguistic competence and his knowledge of the literature of many languages, East and West? Who can match the depth and range of his linguistic and historical erudition? Who can compete with his capacity or polemic, and yet the vast and generous range of his specialisms and interests? What marks David out from his competitors in academic scope is the way that his sympathies entirely break academic bounds. For he is also an expert on many sports, as we've been discussing this afternoon, and many realms of popular as well as classical music. Does he ever sleep, I find myself wondering. And of course, we now know that he has only ever been trying haltingly to keep up with his vastly wiser and more learned dog, Roland. Sadly, Roland has so far always turned Cambridge down as a lecture spot, but we are still delighted to have his master here instead. David has already produced a vast number of works ranging from theological aesthetics to a novel account of religious experience, to a defense of strong universalism and a rethinking of doctrinal development, as well as writings on the frontiers between science and philosophy and religion and politics. Additionally, he has produced an astonishing new literal translation of the New Testament, which promises to reorient our understanding of that work. In one dimension, the current series of lectures builds upon that translation and David's accompanying reflections. In theological terms, it could be considered to be his most ambitious endeavour to date, insofar as it makes strong connection between his reading of the Bible on the one hand and his interpretations of the history of doctrine and of the question of the natural and the supernatural on the other. In terms of the New Testament, David avoids simply underwriting standard orthodox readings, and yet at the same time, supposedly historical readings arguably based upon doubtful speculations concerning textual transmissions. Rather, he insists upon a more solid sort of historicity based first upon an exacting reading of the Greek, and secondly, upon all that we can certainly or at least plausibly know concerning the syncretic culture of the time of Jesus and the apostles, which already involved Judeo-Grecian fusion. Against a fantasizing of a pre-Christian Judaism in the image of a later Protestantism, David invokes the dominant religious outlook, outlook of the period, which had much in common with so-called pagan surrounding cultures and typically involved a picture of a continuous cosmos, spatially and materially linked to a high God at its apex, and containing between the divine at one end and base matter at the other, many intervening degrees of spiritual and animal powers, all mutually influencing one another. This focus allows him to avoid a problematic duality, either a liberal proposing that the outlook of the Church Fathers was impl implausibly in total discontinuity with that of the New Testament, 
or like some orthodox theologians suppressing the degree of its discontinuity, most apparent in its relatively diegetic and exhortatory idioms, largely free from philosophical speculation or outright philosophical categories. Rather, David shows how the vertical or speculative concerns of the fathers are anticipated by the often apocalyptic focus of the New Testament, with its accompanying concerns with mystic initiation and the disclosure of a higher and hitherto secret wisdom, while the change to a more reflective idiom nonetheless tends to mark a certain rupture, which slowly eventuated. In all these respects, David is already performing an important service to the discipline of theology by healing the damaging division between biblical scholarship and theological speculation, but showing how this can be achieved by overcoming an outlook upon the Bible, which has never escaped Latin, Protestant, and modern biases of certain kinds. When these have been overcome, then the profoundly complex theological character of the New Testament becomes more apparent, along with the challenges it offers to some received theological views. The sense that David is charting a new path between old and sterile oppositions is sustained in terms of his approach to theological doctrine. Neither a liberal revisionist nor a rigid insister upon the perfection and completeness of received creedal formulae. With blunt historical accuracy and analytic acuity, he suggests that the Chalcedonian formula said little different from its main rivals if it managed to say it more elegantly. Beyond this, it remains a matter of continuously contested interpretation of the meaning of nature and persons and so forth. The cleaving of a new path in this respect is most apparent in David's negotiation of what one can broadly call the Arian question and how he links this to the question of continuity and discontinuity with scripture. <coughs> Building on the work of Rowan Williams, he argues that what became the Orthodox party were at first the radicals, revisionists and innovators. The Arian perspective for which the sun was a lesser emanation from God who had become incarnate on earth was more in keeping with the shared cosmic outlook of the period as already described. And yet David is not in any way questioning the rooting of orthodox doctrine in the Bible. On the contrary, he insists that the New Testament contains many statements that connect Christ with the Godhead in itself in an anticipated way. It was attention to these statements, which in part accounted for the later patristic shift to the equality of the son with the father. Again, like Rowan Williams, Hart insists that this revision with respect to Christ involved also and inevitably a metaphysical revision. If the divine could only be on the uncreated side of the ontological divide, then this divide becomes more absolute. Only God himself can bridge this in such a way that Christ being unambiguously God paradoxically entails him being also unambiguously and fully human, even though these opposites must coincide if we are to know God at all and to be redeemed. I need to ask David why he seems to deny the reality of irreducible paradox, which surely seems to arise whenever we try to talk about the infinite and its relation to the finite. It is at this juncture that David makes novel links between the orthodox revision and the later and contested trajectory of Christianity. To begin with, in the New Testament, we have, as C.S. Lewis noted, an unprecedented fusion of the mythic with the realistic, in such a way that the most mythic gospel, that is John's, is also the most concrete, as David notes. It is this fusion which gives rise to the sense of incarnation, and yet within the mediated cosmic vision, such as to imply an Arian version of incarnation, despite the radical moments of the New Testament that point beyond this. As David suggests, an implication of the orthodox rupture, which drastically separates creator from creation, could be that the notion of a mediated participatory analogical cosmos lapses. 
In the course of Christian time, this occurred in various degrees from at least the 11th century onwards. But David clearly does not see this loss as desirable. But if it is to some degree inevitable, then he avers with characteristic melancholic nuance that there has been loss as well as gain. One can be sure that he is thinking here of the Pipes of Pan chapter of the Wind in the Willows. <laughs> Yet he is clear that the loss of the cosmic perspective is not justifiable in biblical terms, whose mythic realistic mode is inextricably connected to the cosmic and the apocalyptic. As David argues, not only is there no contrast of disenchanted nature with extrinsic supernature beaming in from beyond in the New Testament, there is not even any clear philosophical category of nature. Nature for this text denoted birth and genetic origin, even in relation to God, with whom we are in a kind of material continuity. It follows that a residue of our born kinship with God, in contrast to our ultimate difference from him, reappears throughout Christian history, just as the divine human being of Christ can be understood in more drastically unitive and cosmic reaching ways, as opposed to those readings which tend to emphasize the discreteness of the natures, and so thereby to displace the focus of theology from incarnation and deification to the arrival of grace and human passivity in the face of grace. And indeed, David suggests that in origin, we find sustained a balance between what will become speculative orthodoxy on the one hand and a sustaining of the cosmic and mythic on the other, which undergirds origin's invention of most of the norms of Christian biblical exegesis and mysticism. What might be suggested here is two things. First, the key to reintegrating the biblically cosmic with orthodox Christia Christology to espouse Paul's indication of a pre-existent humanity with divinity of Christ that is intrinsically bound up with the mediating roles of the great angel and eternal Adam. Secondly, that when he sees the incarnation as the ultimate theurgic descent of the divine into our human rituals, in default of the capacity of mere theoretical reflection to reach God, then it becomes perhaps more possible to integrate the notion of an unmediable gap, nonetheless with the magic of cosmic mediation. If God alone can descend and mediate, then the intermediate powers, the saints and angels, are all the more able to accompany him in this task. Though God's redemption alone is enough, this includes and does not render superfluous the aid of the manifold others any more than the existence of God renders the existence of the creation, which belongs to him as his work, unnecessary. But I imagine that these very Russian suggestions will be much to David's taste. I now hand the floor over to him. Well, I can't live up to the introduction, um, so I'll simply say thank you, and uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor to be delivering these lectures. Um, I was hoping uh, in in what what's to come in the in the days ahead to be as provocative as possible, um, but I'm not sure I succeeded. So I have to ask you your, your, your pardon in advance if any of this fails to be scandalous. Thank you again for that introduction. I, I, I'd like to begin uh, with a quotation from Acts. It's a very, um, it's it's one we all know. In him we live and move and are, as indeed some of the poets among you have said, for um, for we two are of his race. So being God's race, Yenos, race, offspring, family, genus, we ought not to suppose 
dot, dot, dot. Excuse my demotic, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm constitutionally incapable of pronouncing Greek any other way. In this first lecture, I, I would like to pose just a, a series of questions of a slightly provocative, but I hope not irreverent nature. I know that what I want to talk about has consistently proved to be perhaps the most volatile topic in Christian theology in the history of faith. No debates have been more contentious or more catastrophically consequential than those concerning Christology. Among all the issues that have down the centuries divided believers and afforded them opportunities for despising one another, uh, at least those especially uh, adamant on how we should formulate the unutterable or express the ineffable. None has resulted in greater institutional fragmentation, political disarray, and religious dissension than has that of the unity of all things in Christ. And the mischief continues down to this very day. The reason for the issue's perennial volatility is not, it seems to me, difficult to find. Christology is Putatively, the attempt to say how in the single person of Jesus of Nazareth, divine nature and human nature have been united to and reconciled with one another. But, and I'll note at the start, this is the somewhat, what I hope, scandalous claim I want to defend in what follows. Such a project can never arrive at a wholly satisfactory conclusion, not simply because the mysteries towards which it points exceed our understanding, but also because the very terms in which it has been conceived and phrased are probably inherently inadequate. It's rather late in the long Christian day, admittedly, to advance such a claim as a reproach or a protest. I'm certainly not advocating some great revision of the tradition's established language. Two natures in one person has to remain the basic grammar of Christian confession. And after all, no one in all likelihood has anything better to propose. Um, what, however, remains open for discussion and for quarreling over is how both that duality and that unity are to be understood. Whether, for example, person here understood, uh, corresponds only to the word prosopon or to hypostasis or to both understood as synonyms of one another, how hypostasis relates to physis and then physis to usia, with the Physis means an ensemble of properties, or instead means a more radical or more concrete kind of identity, and so forth. And I suspect that such questions are inherently unanswerable, uh, in part uh, because of a fundamental inadequacy, as I say, in the various resolutions towards which the Christological controversies of the high patristic period, period increasingly forced all factions, uh, but also that's all that. But also in part because it's precisely the indeterminacy of these words that allows them to function uh, as doctrinal rules of usage. That happens twice in every lecture these days. Uh, we will have advanced as a species when it's down to one. We've, we've mastered the technology that no longer masters us, but we'll never in time overcome our, mass, our, our machine overlords. Certainly, the official formulae of, of Chalcedonian Christology succeed no better at affirming both the full divinity and the full humanity of Christ than do the rival formulae of Coptic and East Syrian traditions, when, of course, the latter, those latter are viewed in the context of Alexandria's or Antioch's native philosophical terminologies. Chalcedon merely established a theological and doctrinal syntax sufficiently vacuous at once to allow, yet also to frustrate, any more ambitiously replete conceptual semantics. And even then the compromise failed. The more vigorously the vying parties strove to assign exact meanings to the words they all variously employed, the more the debates tended to generate verbal distinctions that made no conceptual differences save of the vaguest kinds. The whole process culminating in differences of a far more radical, far more pernicious nature, to be honest, real and permanent divisions within the body of the faith. Now, while those controversies were probably inevitable, the doctrinal vocabulary in which they were prosecuted probably was not. It was Christianity's unique destiny, as it turned out, to venture the story it had to tell about the whole of reality, divine no less than created, on a radical refusal to honor what Lessing famously called the Gash de Gebreite Graben, between accidental truths of history and necessary truths of reason. 
In fact, though, far more than mere rationality and rational universality were at stake, Christology came to bear an explanatory and imaginative burden that gradually but inexorably accumulated over the course of the first few centuries of the faith and then grew ever more ponderous in the following centuries. Jesus of Nazareth became the locus of the entirety of metaphysics, ontology, cosmology, religion, and history. It was in him the tradition would situate the relation of creation to God, the human to the divine, the one and the many, mortal and immortal, passable and impassable, time and eternity, finite and infinite, beings and being, natural and supernatural, nature and grace, and even perhaps the symbol and the symbolized, or history and myth, and hence in him also it would discover with ever-repeated astonishment the place where all these distinctions uniquely and mysteriously achieve an ultimate indistinction from one another in a single event and a single identity. From the period of the Nicene Council, moreover, first through the official defeat of Arianism and then through the defeat of its ever-waning echoes in eunomianism and other conservative theological factions. This total venture became all the more radical in its implications. In the intellectual world of the three centuries before Nicaea, especially in the eastern half of the empire, and most especially in the ambit of Alexandria, almost the entire educated class, pagan, Jewish, or Christian, had presumed the existence of a derivative or secondary divine principle and had embraced what one might call a subordinationist ontology. It's an overused word, but there's none better available, of the relation of the sublunary, celestial, and supercelestial realms. And one has to keep in mind all three for the time. Um, almost every system attempted with greater or lesser complexity and with greater or lesser mythical adornments to connect the world here below to its highest principle by populating the interval between them with various intermediate degrees of spiritual reality. The earliest Christians could not think of God's heaven as some reality utterly discontinuous with the material cosmos. The distance between God and creation was not merely spiritual, but spatial, or, or rather the spiritual and the spatial were not as yet clearly demarcated from one another. Within that continuum, moreover, no absolute distinction was drawn between creaturely and divine natures except in terms of eminence of power. Much less was any drawn between nature and supernature, the latter not being a biblical or ancient category in any meaningless in any meaningful sense. Sorry. The word theos was as yet a predicate, not a proper name, and even the distinction between the divine and the creaturely could be marked only inexactly as a broad and graduated interval comprising several emanated or deputed degrees of divinity progressively diminishing in scope and capability as they descended the spheres. The celestial distance separating the earth below from the hyper-Uranian realm, the super-celestial realm, that is the Father or God Most High, was thronged with countless powers, principalities, and divinities. Gods, diamonds, angels, stars, what have you. Who in the thinking of the time occupied a rather equivocal station between the divine and the creaturely within the one order of nature? That ambiguity was evident even in the special reserve of the Arthras and uniquely proper title Otheos to designate God Most High, as distinct from the Anarthras secondary and somewhat honorific title Theos, a semantic cordon that was something less clear than, say, what later centuries would define as analogia entis, or then the difference of being from beings. It was rather more like the simple rule of primum in aliquo genere, the principle that in every genus there is one supreme instance that possesses per se the true essence of that genus, and that therefore it is the prime source and cause of that essence in all its derivative instances. In the late antique vision of things, God Most High enjoyed a hazily liminal supremacy, at once transcendently containing the totality within himself, and yet himself falling within its compass. With the triumph of the Nicene synthesis, however, an entire exquisitely elaborate but conceptually inchoate picture of reality was destined to dissolve. 
Arius had clung quite understandably to what he regarded not only as immemorial Christian orthodoxy, but as the sole theological model adequate to preserve a proper sense of the Father's transcendence, which he and many others could imagine only in terms of the ontic supremacy of the unrivaled one who dwells in light inaccessible, there above the unreachable beyond. He and they took it to be the testimony of reason, tradition, and scripture alike that the Logos was the highest of heavenly powers, perhaps the angel of mighty counsel, perhaps Michael, the commander of the heavenly hosts, and there's ample reason uh, for such titles in Matthew and Mark and one in Luke. Perhaps the heavenly high priest or Corypheus, but not God in the most proper and highest sense. After all, had not the apostle clearly distinguished between the one God, the Father from whom all things come, and the one Lord, the, the Deuteros Theos, as the intellectual world of the time would, would, would denominate him, through whom all things come. And yet the other side of the dispute had what would prove to be the more compelling, if also admittedly the more compelled, view of the matter. To wit, if it is the case that to use the familiar formula, God became human, that the human being might become God. How could the Son be a lesser expression of God or even merely a creature? It would seem to be a necessity of logic that only God is capable of joining creatures to God. Any inferior intermediary will always be infinitely remote from God as such. If it is the Son who joins us to the Father and only God can join us to God, then the Son must be capable of the Father, so to speak. And so must be God, not only in an inferior and secondary, but in a wholly consubstantial sense. And in time, of course, the logic would be extended also to the Spirit who joins us to Christ, and only God can join us to God. Here, moreover, the now established doctrinal narrative irresistibly demanded a new speculative grammar. What had been obscurely but irreversibly inaugurated at the Council was a novel and more rigorous metaphysics of transcendence. In affirming the consubstantiality and co-equality of the persons of the Trinity, Christian thought had also affirmed that it is the transcendent God alone who gives creation being not through a necessary diminishment of the full divine presence, and not by way of an economic reduction of the highest divine power in lesser divine principles, but as the infinite God who is nevertheless present in the finite by an absolute immediacy of act. God, most high, is for all things at once, superior sumo and interior intimo, not merely the supreme being atop the summit of the hierarchy of beings, requiring lower intermediary beings in order to act within creation, but rather the one who is transcendently and so immediately present in all beings, the ever more inward act within each finite act. And this was, or would give rise to in time at least, an extraordinary intellectual and spiritual achievement at the metaphysical level. We gain by losing, of course. That line was more powerful before you gave it the <laughs> proleptic, but we gain by losing. Much had been gained, clearly, above all, a more radical sense of the intimacy of God's presence to creation. But something of singular imaginative beauty was, as a result, progressively abandoned. That initially inconspicuous but ultimately vast metaphysical revolution had resulted from a long and intense contemplation of a specific, concrete, historical event. And this meant that the theology of this newly grasped divine intimacy in the story of creation and salvation would be articulated primarily in the medium of history, not of nature. And then, too, whether accidentally or necessarily, the shape of nature in its fullest analogous range, the whole cosmic order of life, would come to be altered in Christian imagination, at first subtly, but in time, drastically. With the overthrow of the older subordinationist theology, the late antique cosmic vision, with all its generous imprecisions and its minutely graded tears of natural divinity, and divine naturality and its radiant participatory hierarchies increasingly became ever more otios and even something of a distraction. Mind you, it was not inevitable that all those uh, 
luminous and genial presences would have to depart, and nor did they do so all at once. For many centuries, angels and saints would continue to man the heavenly battlements and ward the sacred places here below. There's a, there's a wonderful article by Peter Brown from many years ago that argues that it wasn't really until the 11th and 12th centuries that late antiquity's luminous community of mediating powers began their long recessional out of the larger cultural imagination. But even then, the angels had, had by that time, already been largely stripped both of their powers of cosmic superintendence and the somewhat ambiguous autonomy they had enjoyed in the second temple Jewish and early Christian periods. I'm not saying incidentally that the seeds of a disenchanted world had been planted or nurtured at Nicaea. What I do wish to say is that the post-Nicene synthesis required ever clearer and stricter delineations between the divine and the created. Neither the difference between creatio ex nihilo and mere demiurgy nor the difference between divine begetting and divine making could any longer remain comfortably uncertain. And certainly the, the, the two differences couldn't remain comfortably intertwined with one another in a great vague something. I've crossed out whatever word I originally wrote there and I shouldn't have done that. So I have none in the depth of my tongue. The interval between the there above and the here below, which had for so long been a spacious realm of inexact and relative degrees of the divine and the natural, now had to contract into an inviolable line of demarcation. Even the older, more continuous ontology of the temporal and the eternal began inexorably to change into a bare relation between God's timeless now and the incessant flow of creation's becoming. The two set up hard against one another on either side of an impermeable metaphysical partition, unmediated by the gentle gradations of an intervening Ionian or Ival realm, the heavenly Ival, the heavenly Eon, the angelic Eon. The fully monotheist reserve of all language of Godhead for the transcendent God alone, which had not been a Jewish or a pagan or a Christian fait accompli in earlier centuries, was now a fixed destiny for Christian thought. Barely enough, one that reached its first full expression in the language adopted by all parties in the controversies and continued to unfold for more than three centuries after the Nicene Council, and that even then reached not so much a resolution as an armistice. As Rowan Williams and others have astutely observed, the more the full divinity of the Logos was proclaimed, the more also the full humanity of the incarnate Son had to be asserted, lest the presence of God in Christ be mistaken for a divine substitution in Jesus for some element of his humanity, such as his soul or mind. By the end, everyone had to grant that Jesus of Nazareth possessed not only a human body, but also a human soul in all of its natural aspects. And yet his identity as the eternal son could not be merely the juxtaposition of two distinct someones with one another, which despite the traditional caricature the Chalcedonians have, uh, was not the Christology of the great Antiochenes of the period any more than it was of any other faction. The notion of a god or angelic being veiled in flesh or of a man animated by some alien divine faculty was no longer able to bear the full weight or splendor of the newly established Christian confession. So the determination was quickly reached, spontaneously rather than deliberately, of course, that the distinction of deity and humanity in Jesus should be described in terms chiefly of two natures, which is to say, two naturally immiscible realities miraculously reconciled in one life. And this determination would inevitably militate any, against any strong sense of a sphere of natural commonality between the divine and the human, and would threaten ever again to reduce the unity of the two in Christ to an extrinsic relation merely factitiously overcome in a single inherently paradoxical event. But of course, an inherent paradox is just a logical nonsense. I will pause here to explain that, that an inherent paradox as opposed to a paradox that can't be uh, dispelled or too difficult. <laughs> I just, um, paradox is, after all, something that seems to be contradictory, but isn't. An inherent paradox is simply a contradiction glamorized as something mysterious. So, Moreover, the language condemned theology to an often neuralgic 
even neurotic anxiety to shore up the ramparts, dividing the two natures with ever more impregnable devices. One sees this especially acutely in a great many later theological strategies for widening that disjunction to as great a degree as possible. Um, just to be ecumenical here, I can choose one from uh, you know, uh, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant uh, traditions. There's the ontological gulf that Baroque Thomism fixes between nature and supernature, which to my mind renders the entire Christian story of creation and salvation unintelligible. There's the barricade of really distinct and eternal energies that polemism erects within the Godhead between God's action in creation and the Trinitarian taxes of relations, which thoroughly subverts the logic of Nicaea. Or in the dialectical hyperboles of Bartianism at its most mystically incoherent, such as in the first version of the Rimmer brief, for instance, which too often seem to reduce the gospel to a collection of obstreperous oxymorons. Again, these are all these traditions at their worst before the, I get nasty letters from Bart scholars. I'm not accusing him of that. I mean, except in his in his moments he had a little bit of too much Rhenish wine during the during his seminars. Uh, one sees it too, however, in the contrary efforts made down the centuries to preserve a stabler equilibrium between the two natures to, so as to avert a precipitation into dualism. Um, you know, hearty embrace of Neoplatonic metaphysics, uh, an analogical ontology, a sophiology, uh, and so forth. Yet from all this welter of divergent theological impulses, no clear consensus has ever actually emerged. I think we sometimes think one has. I mean, we tend to think of Chalcedon as a consensus, but it's a consensus rather like the omerta of the mafia in some ways. You know, it's a, I don't want to sleep with the fishes. You can think of it in fourth century Alexandria, that's exactly what might have happened. But, so what led to Chalcedon was a long struggle over Christological doctrine. And even when it seemed to have been solved, it had left any number of troubling questions, not only unanswered, but largely unanswerable. Among others, the question whether it really made sense to speak of the creature's transformation in Christ, both as utterly gratuitous and yet also as the consummation of the creature's inmost nature. The great unanswered question, for instance, of manualist Thomism, or rather answered badly, wasn't unanswered, unfortunately. None of this was logically inevitable. Setting to one side for a moment the issue of divine inspiration and dogmatic development, which I, I do not question or deny, the problem of how to understand the union of two natures in one hypostasis or person was an emergent one in Christian thought. The vocabulary was certainly not ordained by scripture. Even the language of nature can be extracted from the texts of the New Testament only very laboriously and then assimilated to the later use of the word only by a certain exegetical violence. In those very infrequent instances in which the word thesis appears in the New Testament, it tends to be used with what was originally its most ordinary meaning, origin, derivation, line of descent, family pedigree, race, uh, race in the old sense, that is, of the, the, what people you come from. Its appearance in 2 Peter 1.4 may constitute an exception, assuming the phrase theos kinoni physios does not really mean something just like members of the divine family. But as a rule, the word does not bear the weight of anything so imposing as a large metaphysical category. When Paul speaks in Romans of what is paraphysin, outside nature, he is doing so in much the way in which Aristotle so unfortunately used the phrase in the politics as referring to something outside its proper place in the cosmic or social order. In Paul's case, meaning either outside the natural processes of procreation in the first chapter of Romans or in the most overly uh, um, misinterpreted verse, perhaps in the whole whole line corpus, other than the one about vessels of wrath, outside a natural line of descent or, or, or pedigree, or the, the image of being grafted on, the wild olive being grafted into the natural tree. 
For as Ephesians says, it is from the Father that every kindred within the heavens and upon the earth receives its name. All spiritual beings, whether below or above the moon, whether on the earth or among the planetary spheres and fixed stars, share in a single divine and natural genealogy, a single genus or kind. Kind. I, I want to point out, by the way, I mean, Iparhantes Tutheu, notice that. Um, in that ac ac acceptation, Thesis delivers little in meaning from Yenos, the, the way in which Thesis was used in Romans. And this brings me to those verses from Acts which I, with which I began the lecture, which recount the story of Paul favorably quoting someone, probably either Cleanthes or Aratus, the effect that we're all simply, insofar as we are human, God's race or offspring or family or genus. And then radicalizing the claim by speaking of us as quite literally God the congeners of God Most High. The, 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 the phrase he uses uh, is iparhantes tu thou, not iparhantes thou. Nota bene, the definite article in that phrase. This is not to deny that the New Testament distinguishes between the attribute, attributes proper to divinity, broadly construed, and those proper to the realm of generation and decay, the principal difference, however, is, for want of a better word, physiological. The difference between immortal and mortal frames, which is also, in a very real sense, a spatial separation. We've come to think of the thing's nature as something like its intrinsic essence. All for the best, perhaps. For Paul, however, and really for the whole of the New Testament, our essence does not necessarily differ in any significant way from that of astral intelligences or angels, or heavenly spirits of whatever kind. He was a man of late antique Greco-Roman Second Temple Jewish culture. Rather, our bodies, bodies of flesh and blood, of sin, bodies of death, are what separate us from that which is above, and it is our bodies that must be redeemed. Romans 3.23, our bodies must be redeemed. It may be something of a popular piety also among systematic theologians to proclaim that there is no such thing as a logos asakos, and that nothing of the sort is implied by the prologue of the fourth gospel. Anywhere in the New Testament, that is, there's no such thing. Whether one takes that to be a plausible reading of the New Testament or of John, and in the latter case, I don't, as regards at least authorial intention. It's certainly the case that for Paul, there is and must be, at least after the resurrection, a Christos asakos, a fleshless Christ, whom we know no longer according to the flesh, as otherwise he could not save us. Paul's quite clear on the matter. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, of God neither does perishability inherit imperishability. Uh, we spend many centuries pretending that the word sarx in Paul means sinful human nature, except that he's so explicit again and again that it means flesh. The flesh that can die. It's precisely by his, that is Christ's, having set aside the composite, inherently perishable, animated, carnal body, the soma psychikon, and assumed instead a spiritual body, a soma pneumaticon, like that of angels, that Christ has been transformed into life-giving spirit. Conquered the celestial powers, taking his seat beside the Father above, and thus too, as spirit, he can also join us to himself, return again to raise us up out of the realm of death, here below the moon, and make a way for us through the heavens to the Father. He's quite clear about this in Romans 8 and in Philippians 3. It seems clear that for Paul, Sihi was chief, or Suke, as John Miller got banked in his Sihi was chiefly the life principle proper to the realm of generation and decay which cannot depart the aerial and terrestrial sphere, while pneuma is a kind of life not bound to death, and so is able to move at liberty among the cosmic realms, below and above. And in Christ, we too shall be set free from our somata epigea, earthbound bodies, and receive somata epurania, epurania, heaven traversing bodies, heaven stationing bodies, in their stead. For whereas the former are limited by decay, dishonor, and weakness, thora, atania, 
asthenia, the latter enjoy incorruptibility, glory, and power. Aphasia, doxa, and dynamis. So the first man out of the earth, earthly, the second man out of heaven, as the earthly man, so also those who are earthly, and as the heavenly, so also those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall bear the image of the heaven traversing man. This is for Paul nothing less than the transformation of the psychical composite into the spiritual simple. The metamorphosis of the mortal fleshly body that belongs to soul into the immortal fleshless body that belongs to spirit. We shall be changed for this perishable thing must close, it, close itself in imperishability. And this mortal thing must clothe itself in immortality. So then, much of the hope of the early Christians falls wholly in line here with many of the highest spiritual longings of, Great Ro of Greco Roman late antiquity, Jewish and pagan alike, divinization through the assumption of a glorious and immortal form, ascent through the ethereal heavens. Assimilation to the state of angels or demons or gods or stars, entry into the highest sanctuary in or above the heavens. Again, we today may think in terms of differing essences or natures, distinguishing gods, angels, and human beings from one another. But in the New Testament, the primary distinction is merely one of corporeal condition. Even in John's gospel, Jesus differs from other men in part because he descends from above, and thus his flesh, unlike the mortal flesh of those from below, is an eternal heavenly manner. And the logic of creaturely glorification or divinization, so understood, is a matter so not, not, uh, so not so much of the union of two entirely different natures in a single hypostasis or prosopon, as of the per perfection of the nature common to spiritual beings in a spiritual body. The flesh, Paul tells us, is but a terrestrial tent in which we groan with fervent longing to be clothed instead in uh, uh, to be clothed instead in our celestial dwelling, so that we should not be found exposed and naked and so that what is mortal within us might be swallowed up in life. To be raised is to have the body of objection conformed to the body of Christ's glory. As of yet, the language of two natures is at most a premonitory shadow or a ghostly implication within the deeper logic of the text taken as a whole. Very well, then. That would seem to be the issue. That deeper logic which again, I'm more than eager to affirm. I, as I said, I'm trying to raise the questions here and not, not uh, present a final picture. The New Testament's predominantly somaticentric theology of resurrection and glorification is most certainly in keeping with many of the most broadly shared religious aspirations of the Hellenistic world, perfectly continuous with both pagan cults and Jewish Second Temple mysticisms of heavenly ascent and divine or angelic metamorphosis. But at the same time, the New Testament language of glorification in Christ that pervades the New Testament includes many promises that seem far to exceed the more common late antique motifs of divinization or glorification, seeing face to face, knowing even as we are known, being filled with the whole pleroma, the whole fullness of God the Father. Again, otheos in Ephesians 3.19, indwelling and being indwelled by him who is himself in the Father, according to John, and so becoming like him and being able to see him as he is, which is probably mean to see Christ as he is, but that's on the heels of assertions that uh, to see Christ is to have seen the Father, or being made one in the oneness of the Father and Son and receiving the glory they share eternally, even perhaps in Matthew, the pure-hearted being enabled to see God, ton theon absante, I mean, again, at least the definite article is used there. Here, it seems reasonable to think we're talking about something more than the mere elevation of spiritual beings out of our mortal world into the immortal company of their spiritual kith on high. 
These promises seem to point toward a real union with the transcendent God, and surely this, one could argue, authorizes language of a union and a miraculous commerce in Christ, and so in us, between two utterly distinct natures. And perhaps it does. Even so, such language, and this is the point I'm chiefly trying to make here, is still the imposition upon the texts of a category neither native to them, nor necessarily compatible with the language they do, in fact, the scriptures that it, in fact, do, in fact, employ. It's certainly very different from the bold familiarity, or even, from, you know, more precisely, the familiality of the language of a single divine and human, Yanos. And so, to determine whether that imposition truly makes sense of the tradition's larger narrative of divine incarnation and creaturely divinization, it's probably wise to confront a certain hermeneutical tension that subtly but irrevocably entered theological, irrevocably, sorry, entered theological tradition after Nicaea, between that is what one might broadly and imprecisely call the mythic and the metaphysical dimensions of the tale, which is again far too broad, but I'll try to make it less so. A little earlier in this lecture, in this lecture, I'm still a bit uh, jet lagged. Forgive me, the occasional slip here. In my previous uh, remarks on it earlier in the lecture, I, I suggested that the identity of Jesus of Nazareth for Christian tradition constitutes a unique point of indistinction between myth and history, and this seems obvious, really. In the story of Christ, the most mundane particularities of time, place, culture, and material conditions promiscuously consort with many of the most universal human mythic motifs. In him, the invader of the underworld, the deity incognito, the descending god, the hero assumed into the heavens at the end of his quest, the dying and rising god, and so forth, all emerge from the perpetual twilight of illud tempus, into the full noonday clarity of historical particularity. At the same time, the man of sorrows, the wandering sage and prophet, prophet of Greco-Roman Galilee and Judea, the son of Adam who has nowhere to lay his head, the murdered victim of political and religious institutional power, and so forth, is unveiled as the fullest possible revelation of God, the fullest possible theophany. And of course, by myth, I, I mean, I hope it goes without saying, I don't mean a fiction or a tall tale, or uh, I, I mean rather only a special narrative and imaginative idiom that touches on a dimension of the truth where reflection, in fact, can't be easily discriminated into two merely complementary poles. And it thus has the power to disclose truth, not truths, if not available, at least not fully available through purely empirical propositional historiographical methods. Thus, the most mythic of the canonical Gospels, John's, is also, in many respects, the one told from the most objectively concrete theological perspective. Even so, the sheer singularity, intensity, and indiscertibility of this coincidence of narrative idioms in Jesus have created over the course of theological history a vital but often anxious tension between contending impulses to preserve the narrative's integrity against either its more fissile tendencies or its more fusile tendencies. I mean, the story can't be allowed to separate into utterly inc in incompatible and so therefore di uh, empty diegetic genres. But neither can it be allowed to collapse into an utterly fantastic confusion of voices. And this particular tension, especially after Nicaea, came inevitably to express itself in a more general tension between, as I've, as I've said above, the story's mythical and mental, <laughs> mythical and metaphysical dimensions, or perhaps I should say framings. In the Gospel of John, for instance, there's already obviously a fruitful ambiguity in the ascription of divine status to Jesus. At times, the language and imagery seem barely distinct from any other late antique picture of a heavenly agent ascending into earthly guise and then ascending again out of the earth. 
At other times, however, the language and imagery point toward a real unity of Jesus with the transcendent God, the Father of all, even to the point of full equality, as when Thomas says to the risen Christ, O Kyrios mou ke, O Theos mou, my Lord and my God, again, both this time with, with the definite article. After Nicaea, though, when the doctrine of the equality and essence of Son and Father had been established, the balance of authority between these two intonations shifted irreversibly in one direction. The older imagery of the pre-existing great angel or secondary god or logos asakos, who at some junction in the history of creation had descended from the Ionian heavens into, sub into sublunary time, now had to yield over complete hermeneutical primacy to the more paramount imagery of the incarnate logos, who is at once fully a man upon the earth in time, and also fully the transcendent God in the eternity beyond all ages, beyond all eons. Yet this task of demythologization, if you'll pardon the term, was complicated from the first by the equal or greater authority that the scripture seemed to accord the former imagery. And ever since then, the effort to shift the hermeneutical balance from myth to metaphysics without losing the narrative balance between myth and history has never ceased to be a process both precarious and inconclusive. Theology has been marked since the first ecumenical council by a restless uh, uh, oscillation between efforts, on the one hand, to maintain the loftiness of the metaphysics against the degrading gravity of myth, and on the other, to preserve the radiant particularity of the myth against the corrosive universality of a metaphysics. At times, Theology has seemed embarrassed more by the extravagance and naive vulgarity of the grand epic of God in Christ, at other times more by the etiolated rigidity of its logical abstractions. Even with the near total abandonment of the dominant angelomorphic Christology of the early church, about which I'll have much more to say in, fall, in, in lectures to follow, Theology could not free itself from this anxiety or this indecisiveness. Thus, over the centuries, an impulse toward constant and frequently necessary re-mythologization re of the story has been every bit as prominent a part of the tradition as the impulse towards demythologization. Again, I'm sorry to use those terms. Typically, the two, two impulses have been combined in a shifting, complex counterpoint in one and the same thinker. Even as austere and lucid a metaphysician as Thomas Aquinas, for example, could assent to the proposition that any one of the divine hypostases might equally well have become incarnate, which in one stroke severs Trinitarian theology from the scriptural and patristic logos metaphysics of the Son as the hidden father's one true manifestation, the one true apabgasma, the one the God manifest as opposed to God hidden, and also inadvertently substitutes tritheism for Trinitarianism. It's daring to say these things about Thomas, but I mean, I, it's rather silly, uh, the arguments he makes. Or consider, you know, the great Lutheran theologians of the last century. In the Anglophone world, certainly Robert Jensen, wonderful man, brilliant man. Still, they were undertaking a project that was curiously simul processus et richesis. It was going both at once forward and backward in, 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 on the same path in this regard. At once affirming a fully historicized and, so to speak, humanized, understanding of the uh, of the divine identity of Christ, shorn of all the godly, exotic, Asiatic, Magian, Hellenistic, apocalyptic appurtenances of the tale of a descending celestial divinity from late antiquity, but only so as then radically to mythologize the father in a kind of theogonic and somewhat German idealist register, describing God the father as some fantastic, omnipotent, deliberating, quasi-psychological subjectivity whose eternal but willful or entscheidung, original decision to determine himself as Trinity was accomplished in a real reciprocally passable relation to the finite historical person of Jesus of Nazareth, which is sort of sublated, so to speak, in the spirit as sort of infinite futurity, as, as, Jens, I mean, as, as Robert Jensen liked to put it. 
And I'm not sure that's any less incredible than the ancient angelomorphic picture. It simply fits the, the philosophical storytelling of a different epoch. So let me draw to a close uh, for this evening because I, this the first lecture is the shortest. Um, I've been trying to drag it out by trying to slow down to make it seem grander. I'm not suggesting, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that what became the dominant tendency in post-Nicene dogmatics and the theology was in any sense haphazard or a violation of scripture's integrity. For one thing, the mythic idiom is always already a way of conveying the truth that can never properly be captured in propositions. It's also always, though, for that very reason, an invitation to constant interpretations and reinterpretations, and even perhaps some that might appear to alter the narrative valency of the text profoundly. And so it's, it's perfectly correct for theological reflection to attempt to take the story to another depth or height, or to read it at a new angle, without feeling bound to what may or may not have been the intentions of its author. I admire, for example, greatly by my friend John Baer's recent exceedingly rich and luminous treatment of John's gospel and concur with many of its theological judgments, despite being unable to assent to a number of its purely exegetical moves. For instance, I tend to believe that even if the term logos asakos is of much later theological concoction, and even if authorial intention is ultimately impossible to prove, still the ad literam reading of the Johannine narrative, that of the logos becoming flesh or the one from above entering the darkness below, I believe really is meant to be understood as involving a divine agent who enjoyed an Ionian pre-existence before coming to sojourn in an earthly body. I think that's what the text is talking about. I absolutely agree with Bear that Jesus of Nazareth is not for John's gospel merely an episode in the course of the existence of the divine subject who ultimately shines out from Christ. And I mean, he's taking that line, of course, from Rowan Williams. It's not the episode in the life of a, of a divine subject. But I suspect that in another sense, the earthly existence of Jesus is presented in the gospel. Mythologically, it's true, but not just symbolically, as an episode in the course of the life of the spiritual creature through whom that subject shines. And I'll come back to that in time. I'll simply say that even if I'm mistaken on that count, I think intellectual honesty obliges us to pay attention to the ways in which John's Gospel and other texts of the New Testament, the Pauline corpus most especially, work within the conceptual paradigms of the first century, even as they strain against and refashion those paradigms. We should recall, after all, that nowhere in the New Testament is it ever directly asserted that in Jesus, God became a human being. Even though the whole of the New Testament, I think, irresistibly urges theology toward that belief, that what happened at Nicaea was not arbitrary or merely a matter of imperial policy. In part, this may simply be because of certain semantic scruples shared by Jews, Christians, and pagans in the first century. There simply were very few ways of piously or intelligibly uttering the phrase or theosianitor. God became. God was born, but God or theos with the proper definite article. As it would have seemed to suggest in most contexts that the father of all had undergone movement or change, and by very definition, religious or metaphysical God, or Theos, was a name belonging to the one who necessarily and uniquely does not become, and who cannot be made into something else, whatever that verb in, in John 1.3 means. There was as yet no verbal, much less conceptual convention for distinguishing becoming and being made. And there was definitely nothing like the Nicene Constantinopolitan vocabulary available to express the co-equality of Father, Son, and Spirit. This is, again, not to say that the fourth gospel in any way denies that the incarnate Logos was fully human. Pilate's Ivuo Anthropos, behold the man, the human being, or Anthropos, should be taken with absolute literality. But as I noted in my previous lecture, in late antique, in my previous lecture, in my previous remarks, I originally arranged these differently. I'm a lousy editor. 
In late antique thought, the difference between human beings and other kinds of spiritual agents was chiefly physiological. What John's Gospel says is that the Logos became or, or was made or came to or was born as flesh. And even then, the text describes his advent in an earthly body as an act of having tented among us, a skinos in any mean, which is the imagery par excellence of a nomadic sojourner who comes for a season only then to depart again. And nor is there any affirmation in these flat, in these claims of the flesh. As the same gospel also insists, what is born of flesh is flesh, what is born of spirit is spirit, for the spirit alone gives life, but flesh is worthless. or then. Literally, the flesh ain't worth nothing. Which is where I'll stop for now. Thank you so much, David. Um, David has very kindly agreed to take a few questions. Um, so, um, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I would like to hear more about the relation of soma and sars in terms of, let's say, this hyperbolic body, which is the pneumatic body. In what sense there is sort of 